Did Jonathan sit down? Yes, he did. Oh, okay. Now we can. Now we can go. Good evening. Um, silence your phones, please. Thank you. Welcome to the Hammer. That's, that's another sentence that always makes me feel a little bit powerful and sinister. Welcome to the Hammer. Who was it? Tom DeLay, who was called the Hammer, but he's before some of your time. I'm Stephen Yenser, actually, on, on behalf of uh, the English department at UCLA, uh, one of the sponsors for a long time of these uh, readings. Others include the Office of Cultural and Recreational Affairs at uh, UCLA, and of course the museum's uh, wonderful, uh, wonderfully fruitful uh, public programs uh, headed by uh, the preeminent Claudia Bester, who I hope is here someplace. Um, Rick Kenny, um, his new book, uh, to continue my powerful and sinister motif, uh, is entitled Terminator. As, uh, as Rick reminds us in an addendum to the book, Terminator is the word for the line that separates the dark part from the light part of a heavenly body, uh, like, like Earth. Um, he does not belabor the implication that a poet who calls his book Terminator is himself a Terminator, um, but the word is apropos uh, not only because he, after all, chooses its terms, um, a, a word that's cognate uh, with Terminator itself, but also because he divides his volume into lighter and darker halves, where those two adjectives, lighter and darker, um, characterize uh, tone and view. He divides the book right down the middle so that it falls into two equal sections, uh, separated or, or linked uh, by, by a bridge, which he lets us, or I guess maybe he really, he, he makes us think of as both one poem and two shorter poems uh, equal in length, uh, entitled Memento and Mori, uh, you'll, you'll know the popular Latin motto from the English Lit survey that, you, that you've all taken. It advises us, of course, always to be mindful of death. Uh, the first of these lyrics, uh, let's call them, like the first half of the volume at large, is allegedly lighter, uh, the product of the poet's um, allegro side. Uh, if you if you think of Milton from the, from that same class, uh, while the second uh, the book's second half uh, more melancholy responds more comes more from Il Penseroso. Lingering over these two central contrasting lyrics, uh, the reader discovers an unusual rhyme scheme that locks them very neatly together. Uh, the scheme uh, is, is reminiscent, I think, uh, not, not so much of Milton, but of, but of Dylan Thomas, uh, whose, whose poem Author's Prologue is a hundred lines long and rhymes its first line with its last, its second with its 99th, its third with its 98th, and so on down to the, the couplet uh, at the center. Similarly, Rick's two lyrics together, which total uh, 59 lines, 20, 29 in each, 58 lines, 29 in each. I, I'm never any good at math, uh, but it's something like that. Uh, it also rhymes inside out or, or outside in, I guess, uh, with the resulting couplet at the center. Um, Rick adds a, adds a little Philip uh, to, to Thomas's form. Actually, it's not such a little one. Uh, Rick's rhymes are identical rhymes, so that the last word in the first line is sky, and the last word in the last line is sky, and then the last word in the second line is I, and the 99th line ends in I, and so on, back to, back to the middle. 
the interlocking of the two lyrics um, says something fundamental, I think, about the relationship of apparent contraries, which I think is a, is a theme in the book, uh, contraries like dark and light, for example, or like one and two. Uh, but I'm not gonna, not gonna follow that. But I've, I've focused on the poem too exclusively, uh, perhaps, uh, to show how meticulously composed uh, the work in Terminator is. Uh, in view of the poet's fascination with science, one might call it calculating, but that's a loaded word. Uh, but then almost all terms are loaded, and Rick's palpable relishing of that kind of load, that overdetermination, is a distinguishing characteristic. A logophile, really of the first order, uh, he draws on wildly diverse vocabularies so that his poems bring recherche terms together with antique, uh, even obsolete expressions, nonce words, and language culled both from vintage slang uh, and from edgy uh, contemporary parlance. His enormous word hoard, especially when coupled with his fluency in figurative language, makes on occasion for lines that are dense, variously loaded. Many a tercet there might remind us of that extraterrestrial object in one of Borges's uh, well-known short stories. It's, it's no larger than a die, uh, but it's so heavy that uh, a human being can hardly, hardly lift it from the ground. It's all the more remarkable then, I think, that Rick has also given us some of our most bitingly direct poems uh, about the current nearly catastrophic uh, political uh, weather uh, in, in the country, um, along with uh, some other satiric verses that mock an array of hoary dogmas and uh, faddish preju prejudices. Um, I hope you'll read one or two of those. Some of you might have come across a, a poem called A Prayer, which a very short poem, which recently won a prize, a football poem, um, which is to the point here. Um, so anyway, I hope he reads one or two of those, but I don't know, it's a big book, you know. Uh, it's lyric poems, it's 200 pages long. Uh, and uh, every, every poem is uh, better than the last and better than the next, too. Uh, Rick Kenny. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I was here once before, and I had a, I had a lot of fun. And I, kind words from you are worth a lot, so I, I sure appreciate that. Um, I was planning to read from this doorstop uh, of a book and nothing else. But since you said, I think I'll start with a political poem. It's, it's in two cantos. The first is called The Statesmanship of Mitch McConnell. <laughs> the second is called Profiles in Courage, the Republican Caucus of the 116th Congress of the United States of America. Moving on. Um, that's the shortest poem, but I have some other poems that are short. Uh, is it hard to, can you hear me okay? In the back, that better? Okay. Uh, well, you heard the first one all right anyway. Um, I guess I'll read, Stephen explained the, the, uh, the reason, if you can call it that, for this crazy title. Um, this is an outtake 
it, I managed to get it in. It, I was advised to take it out altogether. I managed to get in an author's note at the end, but it does explain the Terminator. Outtake concerning this book's aggressive title. Hat swoops to Hollywood. That's de rigueur, I guess. Regards to Mr. Schwarzenegger, by all means, no mensana meteor. My title, though, see Wikipedia, refers to the other firmament, where a moon's chiaroscuros curve like nesting spoons. I'll illustrate, pretend it's night. Look up, like the man moth, eyeball pressed against the egg cup moon. Now gently drape your optic nerve across that vocative like so, not curved across the middle like the letter theta, that's as any kid knows the equator, but rather pole to pole like uppercase, like uppercase phi. That line's the terminator. It defines a moving shadow, shearing light from dark, the day night line. You'll note its crawling arc, which sickles everything, bisects this book, too, the valley down the middle, if you look. So I'll read uh, for a while, and I'll, and I'll the, the, cent, the center, that, cent, that valley of the shadow down the center is memento, this poem called Memento Mori. And uh, the poems on the left of, of it are, by and large, on the light side. I have friends who, well, don't forgive me for that. Um, I have a weakness or a fondness for light verse. And uh, some, of, some of my friends feel it's an impeachment of the seriousness of fundamental lugubriousness of the art of poetry. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it's a little hard to put a book together with them. Sometimes they don't play well with the more serious. At any rate, the poems on the left-hand side are, 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 uh, uh, are lighter, and the, the poems to the right of the Terminator are more <laughs> on the discouraging side. I'll try to give us a little lift before we, before we leave. So, uh, And the, the book is, is designed and has five chapters on either side of the Terminator. And they're, they're mirrored, uh, like that poem is. And, so, and they're, so the section titles are the same on both sides. So they're, they're personae on one side and personae on the other side. But the feeling is different. And the, the chapter sections are, are each uh, headed with little tiny poems. They're, they're really 17 line poems. They're, a friend of mine calls them faux coup. They're not haiku, but they're structured like that. I call them hermit crabs. They're really more like epigrams that have crawled inside the shell of a haiku. Uh, the first one is, the first section is Anywhere Not Paris. Our shimmer of days sucked through the howling wall clocks, macerating blades. That may not sound all that light to you, and that's why I'm gonna, that's why I'm gonna skip the first chapter. Actually, I meant to read a poem to start with called Definitions. Word, an interval, a needle biopsy of a waterfall, making digital the rinse of experience by jot and tittle. Poetry, I think, is the distant thunder sound in the drying ink. So I'm going to advance to chapter two, which is called Science Tuesday. The uh, heading poem is, fr is a fragment by Xenophanes. There's nothing anywhere but guessing. Fragment 34, Xenophanes. Read too many of these. Um, the elephant. I, I was thinking of the elephant because the elephant in the, that we're not watching tonight is on television. So, But this is a different elephant. Schrodinger's elephant makes reference to the, uh, uh, the, the blind man and the elephant, which always seemed to me illuminative of some of what the physicists ask, ask us to imagine. Once upon a time in Copenhagen, the blind men set, met to scratch the quantum noggin. They hash things out, agreeing to decree that the wave function of the pachyderm collapses into rope or spear or tree or fan or wall, as senses will confirm but only when the moment's brought to measure. Till then, it's all and none. It's worse than Escher. The key, you'll note, is human observation. Human? How in heaven's name 
The answer is mathematical as all creation involving probability and chance. Lay people simply can't look, no offense, but try now not to think of elephants. Uh, this one is called Science Tuesday. And I guess it has to do with, it, it, it apes the, the, the science news. Um, it, I guess it has uh, implications for our, the moral valence that we bring to these kinds of experiments. Um, it, ref the reference, it makes reference to a, ch a chimera. Um, and a, a chimera, of course, mythical creature, but it's possible scientists can produce a, a, a cross between a goat and a sheep, let's say, not only in the old-fashioned way by putting, leaving them together with champagne, but by um, <laughs> taking the, the cells, growing the cells, and at a very early stage of division, if they put them together and kind of shake them up together like salad dressing, they will rearrange themselves into an animal. And the animal will be part this, part that. And the, the proposal here is that that might be done with a human and a chimpanzee. The first human chimpanzee chimera, christened Pan Sapiens, was born today at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. The Hubble's very wide spool camera regained partial function of its data module and is now on track for the serious starburst. Dr. 32 B, chief of research at Merck, again replied, no comment, ever, he added, to op-ed columns suggesting he's hostile to the press. The sentient rover assembled in America from Chinese parts, parked since Saturday in a no-load zone on Mars, appears depressed. Spokesman for the Generation Meerkat Energy Corporation assured critics that the shutter is soldered, stressing again that containment vessel is at best a metaphor. The starburst, a miracle. The drug had side effects. The rover broke. The baby satyr, Pan Sapiens, died at his surrogate mother's breast. He was hard to look at, she is reported to have said. This is Pan Sapiens III. For me, this is the diorama in the Field Museum where the proto-humans, the Neanderthals, were shown behind glass. Uh, you know, munching on bones, and they don't do that so much anymore. But those dioramas meant a lot to my imagination as a kid. I am Pan Sapiens. I don't speak well, and so I write. Some say I look like hell. I think that's hard. I think I look like you. Pan in, however, never mind the view. You've seen it all your life. The diorama stinking with the crowd of us from Ramapithecus to poor Neanderthal, who's lost his lisp at last and standing tall peers like any fool into my eyes, where once upon a time a wild surmise. Now, dip your quill into the pupil's ink. It isn't how we look. What is it? Think. Ecological meditation, or space is closer than Chicago. Even from Peoria, much closer on the flat, Wide yonder's wide indeed, foil thin for all of that. The mountains puncture most of it. They're human climbers, too, who wriggle dressed in oxygen to a sky scarcely blue, where helicopter blades won't bite and sound itself thins. A 50-minute walk at most on legs which once were fins. The sea is similar, whose deeps a dipstick shows as shallows. Wet an apple, that's the earth, a scarcely moistened chalice. What to make of thoughts like these when the mind wants a yonder wide enough to hold itself? I don't know. I wonder. This chapter three is called World Enough. And these are love poems, a lot of them. That parabola, Galileo. See also Bola and Hula. How? As hours back up in the clogged drain of the glassy water clock, as the assignation of the wind and spun vein, I'll love you as the foghorn vague and rain. Magnetic swipe of the blinking lock is me to you. As cat's paw cowlicks eddies in the spring grain, that's my eye on you. How camels catch the scent of far water clear through obfuscating myrrh, that's me for you. True, I love you as the summer hammer stuns the wold. The what? 
tell you what, I love you as our mer child loves the strong signal of the world, as the world finger pad loves Morse, but more so, worse. Cave reversed. A figure here, this, the cave is Plato's cave, uh, except in, cast in domestic uh, uh, stage set. Sleepy stagger into the kitchen this morning, wherefore wife, blindingly backlit by the conflagration of the sunrise, stunning, and looking only a little less like Athena than one might expect on account of the peculiar little finger motion she's making with her outstretched hand. You look like Athena, but thinner, I say. But she barely notices, so intent is she on these twitchy digitations I don't understand. I don't understand, I say. Rabbit, she replies. <laughs> Duh. I turn into the shadows where unmistakably, woof. Here's a faux coup for you. Wolf, not yet. Wolf, not yet undone, lies abed with riding hood, reading Jack London. Uh, this poem is titled Canis, the, the, that's the genus name, there are two species that, that are, are around the house uh, nowadays. One is Canis uh, familiaris, who is the dog, and the other is Canis lupus, who is the wolf, seems to be making a comeback. Anyway, this is a conversation between Canis lupus and Canis familiaris. Lupus, oh, Eleutheria is the uh, Greek, it's the word for liberty, for freedom. For, there is no man in our moon above. Our howl is the extruded second syllable of Eleutheria, the longing middle of moon. What else is there? Weak dog, despicable dog, who'd trade this for a chain. Familiaris. Listen to old shit for brains howl his hoary old dinner for freedom theory. Oh, woo, really, it's too much. Attend carefully, wolf. Not food, God. Not chain, love. This is a couple of uh, short of these foku haiku. These really are more like haiku. Uh, Katie, Annus Mirabilis. Tumbling octopus traces little braille cursives under a hand's press. Two, cackle and snort. Listen, child, my lamb, laughing in your sleep. I wish I was there. I am. And little crime. She mumble spoke, her voice a tremor, so it seemed, thinking then to spare what was not nightmare, but in fact a flying dream. Her first, I woke her. And this is called Gone World. Making pancakes this Saturday morning with my five-year-old, I'm thinking, how strange, how strange the gone world. Which gone world then, since there are so many? Well, not those famous ones in which we didn't act and ruined everything, or the ones wherein we did, to identical effect, nor that hall of antiquities to come where our placarded combs and costumes all seem quaint, our trash and grocery notes curated, nor that lopped bract of future possibility where nothing is, but rather the one I'm sensing so sharply now, its proximity f fills me with such a mix of joy and rue at the brain-beggaring quotidian squander of luck dissolving in the howl of time right now here, the one gone world we're square in the middle of, the one Maeve too may rue one day as the gone world. And now she is 15. Chapter four is personae, cubicle. Your neighbor, that's Fred, subdued but wild inside, well-dressed in infrared. Biography. Darling, I think our toddler just said amor. How his mother smiled, eyes abrim with omen. In fact, what the little sport had said was lawnmower. And that's how the years ahead would go with him and women. <laughs> uh, 
Um, this, uh, is this about an English department? I wouldn't say so exactly, but there may be an inconsistency that I'm noting. <laughs> we like our poems, even verse, if they're transgressive and subversive. We love their sexual, unsober maunderings as of a toper. We ever valorize an other, whatever fashion deems our druther. We love de trop like Oprah, yet abjure the inappropriate. I, I'm not reading, this is one of three kind of, for me, big deal readings that I'm giving. I, I read at Hopkins last week, and as I was remarking to Stephen, I, I didn't hear any ankle chains as people came in here. But at Hopkins, there were a couple of classes had been highly strongly recommended that they come. <laughs> and and uh, there was a kid who, I couldn't look away. He was you know, texting away on his phone, sitting up on a kind of a railing. And so I read this poem at him. <laughs> here arrayed in Kevlar tweed, it's called Tattered Coat. Here arrayed in Kevlar tweed, hectoring students concerning a screed about which none of them cares a fig, he mildly envies the thingamajig they've hidden to diddle and swipe in their laps, wishing his lecture were one of their apps. <laughs> it was a, a little susurrus of nerv <laughs> nervous laughter, but he didn't bother him any. He kept on, <laughs> so, we, you know, we're still friends. Um, Over coffee, K is often getting cancer. Conjured tumors swell and ebb, like rumors do when worry answers, night's alarming aches abed. Cells dividing everywhere below the microtome of time. No, DNA must needs beware of anything but perfect rhyme. So K describes her symptoms, patients, ghost sarcomas waning, wax. The morning's mortal intimations, K's, again, conturba jacks. So breakfast conversation darkens. Years go by, they have little time. The pillbox rattles, lines of larkins flit uncomfortably to mind. All patterns in a life may shatter. Rarely is it really cancer. Never mind the doctor's data, dread is dread, and love should answer. Self-portrait in lemon juice. Portrait of the artist po post-op. Stephen and I have been <laughs> jawing, as old guys do, about you know, their health issues. <laughs> I, I recently had a couple of knees put it. Po portrait of the artist, post-op. Post-op, I'm pure style. Mona Lisa des Abis, oxycodone smile. Ah, uh -uh. professors, I, sh I shouldn't read this book. This is not, I, I, some of, you might, you might imagine that I don't like teaching, but in fact, it's been a joy of my life. Great privilege of meeting people, who, some of whom are here. Students that I met who are now my friends. It's fabulous. But it's not always like that. <laughs> Professor Stuffy Wonders. How can one tell insolent from stupid in a kid whose range may be broad enough to encompass both? <laughs> it can be tough. Lecturing into the uvula of a yawn, you'll have appreciated the wish to distinguish. Some equations, some questions are ineffable. This one, eminently effable. I meant that grade-wise, but also in the alphabetically cognate bilexical expression typically ending in you, Passim, and I don't mean you, I mean him. <laughs> Self-portrait in lemon juice. This is the last of these. I considered calling this swan song of myself, but it seemed derivative. And I'm resolved to be original in this my art, if not in this my life wherein from start to finish, top to bottom, late and soon, I may be a bit of a William Steig cartoon. And that's not bad. Of the many things I'm not, hero, rogue, roshi, astronaut, there aren't too many that I really rue. I'm mostly glad that I get to be with you. 
But back to what to call this manuscript. My title's strange, I know. All inks encrypt, including blood. Myself, my song, whose? Lie, here writ no one name in lemon juice. And the last poem in, on the left side of the, on the light side of the Terminator, sh shading forward is called Leadership. Uh, say about this. Um, thunderstorm, dog by the bed, dog nose in the eye. The chimney is hoarse under doors. The weather stripping's loose. Another lightning flash, grumblesome Zeus. Twice I've woken with a wet nose in my eye. Poor dog, he quakes with the sky. It's just thunder, old pup, I mutter irritably, his fallible pope. I call him a cowardly cur. I counsel courage. I advise him to master his fear. To hear is to obey, he obeys. Aye, aye, boss, he seems to say with his crazed eyes, rigid, shaking uncontrollably on the floor beside my bed. I'll try, but you don't hear what I hear. And now we're at the Terminator. Now this poem, I, you've probably seen these things. They're, uh, I, was, I think it was in the Uffizi that I saw this. It was a painting, a Renaissance painting, done on corrugated wood, a surface of corrugated wood, so that the, the surfaces were like this. And on this face is, if you look at the painting from this side, it's a beautiful young girl. And if you pass, in front of it and look at it yet from the other side, as you know, it's skull and bones. And this is the memento mori. You see people walking back and forth and there's a center place where she's neither and then she resolves into the death figure. I, I, I was thinking, I wonder if I could do that in, in, a, in a poem and how would I do it? And so I wrote this poem, which as Stephen explained, is the same forward and backward, but it reads differently. It feels, it feels quite different, I think, in the forward direction as in the, uh, the other direction, and, uh, and that's the valley, that's the terminator between these. It changes the book. Memento, rattle, rattle and dirt, sky eye, tongue, milk, blank, slate, blank, mind, the baby, sweet baby, that's the day you're born. The bone and the old joke seem barely apparent. The chuckle, that cackle, whose point time sharpens so, so what? There's time, years, see, and now you're shaving. Note that razor hands of the stopwatch strop to sermonizing tyrant time. Why ever? Just so, bored, half dying, we must endure no dotard nor crone, but croak their quaint, endless, querulous, jealous, dyspeptic displeasures, no doubt. No matter for us, though, we're young. Let crooked teeth grin, wink the world's eyes, whistle past the headstones forever and kiss a girl whose lips whisper love. Whisper love and kiss a girl whose lips forever whistle past. The headstones, crooked teeth grin. Wink, the world's eyes matter for us, though we're young. Let no doubt, no endless, querulous, jealous, dyspeptic displeasures, no dotard nor crone, but croak. Their quaint dying we must endure just so. Bored, half-sermonizing tyrant time, why? Ever note that razor hands of the stopwatch strop too, and now you're shaving years. See, there's time, time sharpens so. So what, the chuckle, that cackle, whose points seem barely apparent, the bone and the old joke? That's the day you're born, sweet baby. The baby mind, slate blank, blank tongue, milk eye, rattle, rattle, and dirt sky. The next chapter is the portrait of a gentleman, which is the opposite of the self-portrait in lemon juice. What am I? Cut forest a moor. Drain swamp, a field. Extinct sea, that's a prairie. Love. Um, a poem called A Winter's Tale. Uh, it refers to the origin of the sonnet in Sicily. It's a love, started as a love song. Uh, but it's really the Persephone myth uh, retold. Once upon a time, unicely in Sicily, so the old story nestles hearthwise, 
Earth stirred, birds stilled, wind hearkened in the sterile wild until at last it caught a new sound. A sonnet melted from a string. It was a bonnet full of flocks and meadowsweet, of posies gathered to a spring, a poppy woozy sweetheart song, a lovely lissom lutely thing. It was that, melodic and a little ludic, before it was anything. Then Pluto, up plunging, chariot root ripped from deep time, plowed the planet's skull, recalling a time when the crust was moony with the craters of his courser's hooves. How many ages his dark banishment? Well, he was back again, and he was hell. Mantle rock like pink jelly parting around him, spattering stone like spume. He pierced the rim of vision, seized sunlight by the hair, and vanished with it forever, blink. And there you have it, the winter's tale. A tale of dawn, yours, mine, all loves, gone. I, think I won't read any more of those. This is Personae on the other side. From sound sleep, Isaac cries out. Again, father's eyes hung with icicles. This poem is a kind of iconic horror. Uh, a girl, a, from a distance, it appears that a girl is surrounded by a group of adolescent boys who are, and the talk, you hear some of the words, and they're not nice words. But pretty soon we realize it's something different. Ask me anything. Half a dozen boys surround her, laughing uproariously. They egg each other on. They make improper suggestions, which she counters with impertinent repartee from Cupertino. We're not afraid for her. She's Oberon. She's Circe. She's Siri. Who knows we know no misery. The whole thing gets repetitive. The voice changes. Now we're afraid for the boys. This is one for the last presidency before last, I suppose, electable, but it's an election year song. One surprise they rarely failed to mention was ordinary people's genuine pleasure at finding him so, well, ordinary. In person, that is, affect-wise, so approachable, so easy to talk to. Tension vanished in the odd sudden of his boyish grin, the metonym for what came next, so predictably catastrophic. The bad joke that depends on what. This begins with the best pun I ever heard, which is, um, as Stephen will recognize it from James Merrill, uh, time, that Everest of concepts. Um, that Everest of concepts, James Merrill, that's the rub, the subject, the doublest lub of the heartbeat held at the hyphen. Here's the feral snarl, the animal trapped in time, that lupine look, that cornered look, the occluding corpse coin sliding like a manhole cover over the lapis sky. This is the line that won't scan. All those metaphors involving roads and rivers and spinning and spools and threads and scissors, the can't, can't dance in the lap of luxury, lazuli, verso recto, respecting the he heaven and its blank unintentions, the rectal thermometer of this cold, howsoever unavoidable thought, change, that wind chime, the far chime. That's what I'm thinking, oh best beloved, and it's about time. Afterlife. Take this as a diagnosis. On time to the strike of a silent bell inside the chapel of the cell, the heretic is whispering. Spittle flickers on his lips. The lizard into shadow slips, the winter wasp staggering. Soon the lymph begins to leak. Telephones commence to speak, the stars back to their westering. Earth laps up above the shins. Another afterlife begins which sometimes feels like lingering. This is world too much. The epigraph is Hobbes obtrudes, Rousseau recedes, father the mirror mouths, I told you so. Money worse. 
Money is killing the world, you worry? Ray, murdering democracy, oiling the shore, shearing the rainforest, fracking the aquifer, quaffing the rainbow from the bloom of the future. <sniffs> Arrow of dream. Drum hope, we're thinking, draw straws at which to clutch. Cash rules, they say, but wait. Fresh news now seeps up from the interior. The shattered hypo cost of history, I mean an omen. Money hath a master. Money to unreason stands. Hands down, ideas trump money. Mooney hope stabs the gloaming. Long nursed, nascent optimism stirs. But is this good news, really? Rifles crackle in the nearing distance. Time change. Here, POTUS holds codes. They tingle in his pocket under Dakotas. These are the launch codes that I'm writing about. Here, POTUS holds codes. They tingle in his pocket under Dakotas. Here, geeky cyber warriors crunch cheese Cheetos over bruised keyboards. Here, plastic sabers across snoozing nominees' knees. There, Siberia. There, vodka defends the spider holes. Damp silos, rust streaking tail fins. There, buzzard throats bend over their wilted map, teeth long and breasts beribboned. Where the Bezoar plutonium? Click Gachistan, click Grand Bazaar. There, no god but god. Click there, click here. Click the speakeasies of Riyadh. Here, POTUS holds codes. They tingle in his pocket under Dakotas. And this is diptych unspoken. A scrap of rainbow caught on a cobweb? That's soul in nerve a quiver. A sky akimbo in transmuting isotopes? That's never, never. This poem's called Embolism. This is the kind of thing you must think about that somewhere out there, there are some big computers, right? They have to be cooled. They're protected, no doubt. Nothing will ever go wrong with them. Uh, embolism, zero, little clot astray in the data stream, lights in the wrong slot. Now try the lights. Now try your bank. Look up, contrail scar sky. Why? What now? Section is called Rome. Sales spike with the toll. Again, guns flood the system like black cortisol. Let's see how I'm doing. This is, I guess, a poem about the fragility of the democracy. I'll read a few poems that are about this. As kids were taught, it's safe as pyramids unshakable and permanent amidst a sordid history, a mock with ids, frocked in all those lesser ocracies the mind of man has proffered up, all crazy and all doomed to end up like the auk. Plus, it's Athenian, we think. Pax Plato, smart man, but no one bats a thousand. Later, though, we see it's really safe as plates a whirl on broomsticks. Trump. And now we're all ears, waiting for the fools with whom we've quarreled to aggregate a mob for all the world like all the mobs in storybooks, the slaking rage that spatters from the joke when Loki rules the moot. We thought it was okay, thought nothing could go really wrong. We thought the fire we played with wasn't all that hot. We thought we could control it and could not. I'll read this one too because it's related. What more it may take. They had brilliance, wisdom. These are the founding fathers where the poem begins. They had brilliance, wisdom, Latin, knowledge, pluck. They copied the Roman and the capital. For the cathedral, they copied the Goth. It all bode well. They took the best when the best was known. For the rest, they'd see, they'd pray, they'd throw the bones. Against anticipated folly of the demos, they set education and crossed their fingers. Doubt obtruded, but liberty proved polysemous, leaving room to leave a little out. Against the tip toward tyranny, 
the alpha problem ever a threat, again we note, they set a Cerberus against himself in hopes no Nash would ever catch a throat. And there you had it, the great experiment designed by men who knew what peril meant. Foreseeing ways their dream could go amiss? Did Jefferson never once imagine this? Could it have been they weren't acquainted with fools as vulgar and venial as equally unfit? Could it have been that they failed to frame the rules no future Umwelt might discomfit spit for luck? Boy toys. Look at the tiny senators. They almost could be real. Their action figure joints so smooth, see how they kneel. Their smiles are a little rigid maybe, but their stomachs sure are strong. Let's try to remember when the big boy's gone, who's gone along. Um, this poem is called Helical, yeah, based on the old thought that the Western tradition is this braid of the Judeo-Christian and the Greek traditions. What is the covenant I fain would learn? That's the handshake deal we struck with God, wherein we agreed to grovel in return for being named his favorite tetrapod. What are the Homeric hymns, I ask? These are a record of the consequence when middle school emotions wear the mask of heaven. Heaven knows how that tale ends. The double helix of the West, two strands rooted in old pots, long intertwining, rise like smoke from fire in the Holy Lands, rise like spinal nerves whose braid, defining what soul dipped in earth can know, life, whose wick we may cut once we have enough knife. Questions for Delphi. Sing, muse. There, there, there's divination, omen is a leitmotif that runs all through it. There are comments, there are things to, efforts to read nature to see if we can learn something about what we are and what might happen. So this is part of a in a line of poems that are about that. Sing, muse, if we, while thinking a thing untrue, try it on the face of the world, willing the lie may ameliorate that future fissuring sheer before us, that black beckon, begging only that our poppycock need seem, not seem too errant, our rants and ritual mutterings and queer ceremonial suits too risible, Sybil speak, tell me, when we do that, do we do right? To repeat, when drives dress themselves in a few abstractions, bridle themselves with a few thready strictures, and get themselves promoted to the prefrontal cortex salaried as ideas, dire critics over serotonin, so to speak, sophist shaking his shaman's rattle in the high glass office, suffice it to say we have civilization. When such ideas, exhaled against the sky's silvering, precipitate in clouds, that is, when ideas graduate as gods, garbed in the advanced fashion of the upwardly mobile, braille bright, labile as one would expect of a personified whirlwind, as it were, well, that circle would seem complete. In a more up-to-date case, when we make of a magma and mantle planet a guise called Gaia, when we propose of her gas-lit, slime-thin skim of biology a god to adore, adorning our postures and censures with sanctimony in her name, do we vouchsafe a future for our children? Chill the answers on the question's face. This is the last poem in this section. It's called Madonna in Blue. It's a, a vidian. It's a I teach in Rome sometimes. Some of my favorite people here have been in Rome with me. Uh, and uh, you see a lot of Ovidian themes. Uh, the, the Persephone is, uh, Pluto thing is just one of them. As you know, it's a, the metamorphoses are riddled with these stories. And they're challenging, and they're especially challenging for students. And we, have to, we talk about them. I mean, these myths are lenses through which, or mirrors, and understand ourselves. But 
I was thinking such things when I was in front of, a, of an Annunciation, uh, the Madonna in blue, as she always is, and the angel there. And I was thinking, I began thinking of that in Ovidian terms. And I wrote this poem called Madonna in Blue. You'll notice um, that it's basically, it's Yeats's Lita and the Swan kind of rewritten. An aneurysm in the sun, a gravity wave, a beating of rainbows against the window pane. The angel, a lunge, an ejaculation of lilies, kneels, knowing. Nods past her upstretched palm, he knows. Against her will, her womb suborned by a god, incubating a future so far-fetched and odd, how could its knowledge from its power culled but show? Her pose, a cobalt spring recoiled. And what should a watching voyeur feel then? Rage? The Avidian horror? Again, the seized girl. Again, Corey covered by ungoverned god, as known is by strange, as past by future. This one, where there are no angels, but no seraphim but us, its mobbing choir. What happened? Didn't the painter's brush catch fire? And this is the last. I'll just read a few more. It's from a section called Vanishing. Another moon. Shh. Here, crescent, then crescent. That's the sound of the shears. Maybe, uh, Stephen, you spoke of this poem before. Maybe I'll read it. It's called Good as a Mile. It's in a couple of different sections. The verse changes. You can hear that. The sky replies to questions posed by human senses, only those. The sky is coy that way. It gulls. It flimmers to the human pulse. As nights are that which is not days, the mirror dimples to our gaze. Cast and casting, call, response, candle, daylight in the sky sconce. I should say the candle and daylight is a theme that goes through the book. Askance, I saw it then. How else? The steering wheel was carousels. Our complement is all outdoors, a fair likeness too, of course. Here's a story, by the by, of how a moat caught in my eye. Today driving, I glimpsed the moon, half moon to be more precise, small smear on an afternoon. All of a sudden, as it struck my eyes, it wasn't the moon, man-tracked, myth-worn, penny-sized, nor retinal nick, nor rhyme on rune, but a rock on the windshield, white as the Christ, an immense, nonce, fully round, planetary thing, locked in a gravitational partner swing with everything. Not the moon, I'm telling you, not a pale communion wafer, but an astral entity, curving, stippled, dented, an entire rock sky yawing steeply away on the shadowed side, adrift. It was bigger than gibbous. It looked sensational as one of those artist's impressions of Callisto rising as seen from the surface of Ganymede. It felt like science fiction. I almost swerved the car. Can I hope to make you see this as I did? Haven't you too yawned late to witness what, some astral smirch or other, forecast aurora, aphelion eclipse, the guaranteed closest approach of Mars or Jupiter, or any dirty comet pinking its horizon per advertisement, commending mine to Empyrean, murmuring wan words like there, then there, forefingering night, well, haven't you? And just as in this failed linguistic instance, missed it. Plants and animals. Consider this. If the fibrillating willow, water as it mostly is, is a sort of slow fountain, that leaves all of us aloft, a low, if granted swifter over the ground, moreover, more of a river. And more of Vivalding. Sometimes you hear liverish complaints about poets who write their poems looking out window. I mean, Katie complained about that once to me. And more Vivaldi. 
symphonic. It's in two sections. One is symphonic, the second is redirect. And the, so the first is the Four Seasons. March up crumples expostulate sky like a mongoose on a doily, welcoming sun as thumb to eye while treating robins royally. Green ferns bend a breeze under summer's awning, windows wide in libraries and books and hammocks yawning. Autumn whooms and fire first sumac, oak, and maple. Napalm bloom soon doused in mist and rain straight as cable. Solstress doldrum, wool chill, the world in cold pajamas, her icicles all prism still as air is after hammers. Redirect. What's the point of penning verse like this? Why not erasures? Something edgy, fresh, fierce on sex or race or glaciers. If we'll just slice the spinal nerve, the sun will settle still. It won't bank, swoop, or swerve. We'll study it at will. That's good advice, cerebral, apt. I'll rhyme, I'll soon rescindo. I do it now, except I keep glancing out the window. <laughs> and uh, just uh, a couple more short ones. This is called If One of Us. Uh, this is where we get anywhere, not Paris, in that first section that I didn't read. Freud, it's, I, the attribution of this is difficult. Um, even my um, sleuth, wizard, weasel librarian couldn't find it. It's attributed. Freud uses it in a letter to his wife. If one of us should die, I shall go to Paris. This is, you've all heard that. Um, if it's in, this is two sonnets linked. If one of us is the title... Should die, she laughs. I shall go to heaven, which sounds not only confident, but gallant, too, and not until you think about it, given the differences in our ages. A land of unlikeness. What would that be for her? A blessed realm, I suggest, turgid with ski instructors, solar energy entrepreneurs, software moguls with mighty abs and intelligent eyes, their opalescent intentions confessed in wines a swirl from sellers certified in France, n'est-ce pas? My goal's otherwise, she says, growing serious, which is the last thing either of us wants. Thin smiles ensue. The land of unlikeness, eerie as ever. But really, she says, really? What then? Vanish then? Live alone among strangers? Tap an umbrella on the porches of old hotels, the kind with tea rooms and oaken banisters and baths down the hall, anywhere not Paris? Oslo, maybe? Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh? No. Tangiers. Which would it be? Hugo by the purpling yodel, watching fjord fog crawl, or swirling anisette in a sweating glass on a lime white blinding terrace, slow ceiling fan batting at the noon stun. Tinctures of the fountain pen, that water clock. You'd tell it longhand in a blank book titled Finnis Tear, that fantasy of anywhere not home, solo, quotidian, fossicking that lifelong midden, dabbing at doing what I said I do and didn't. It's called love. This is another figure that, there's a question that gets asked in the first section and elaborated through Science Tuesday, whether nature, does nature have edges? This is a philosophical question. You know, to what degree do our, does our perceptorium carve the world and to what degree is it given to us in more objective terms? Does, the, does nature have edges? Bees. Thick, it's called love. Bees thick enough to cast a shredding shadow on the grass. Migrating birds on Doppler radar. The little bear above the greater. The full moon muzzy through the fog. Droplets off a shaking dog. The seconds off the clock's a clot. Like anything particulate, these things have shapes, but they don't have edges. So what does? Give me a such as. The razor slicing feels no skin. The noun seems neither out nor in. Where does anything begin? I'll end with two poems. This is a poem to my daughter Maeve. It's a toast called Parting Glass. Here's to the leopard who'd launder his spots, his, the proactive traveler packing some prunes. Here's to gazpacho in coppery pots. Here's to the helium bobbing balloons. Here's to the moons of Jupiter. Here's the, to the whistling steeplejack waving his cap. Skull to starshine sharp as shears and heat on the hearthstone upholstered in cat. Here's to the pollster who's wondering whether. 
Here's to the whiskery frost on the pane. Here's to your shadow, and here's to its tether. Here's to the feathery roof under rain. Woof to your mother, thump to my sons. Kisses for maidens, their aprons askew. Salutes to some strangers I may have met once, and a glass for my ghosts and pukas, boo. Toast to my tailor, whose needles bespoke for Adam and Eve and the coop that they flew. Clink to the mirror, whose deep dubious joke is leaving me less of a him than a who. Who hopes you'll perceive, Maeve, it's hardly a dew. And this is the magic, all mirror and smoke, when the glass is the goblet he's raising to you. And this is called Signs. It closes out the divination, a series of divinations. Uh, the Perseids are cinders now, the summer stars dissolved in wine, the conflagration of the bow extinguished in an autumn rain. Orion's back in the black, behind where moonshine suffocates in cloud, sling other nouns like Charles's Wayne or bear, as some prefer, or plow. Below, blind, what words occlude? Stars tangle in the trees, runes, rising, setting, our ups and downs were never in their lights aligned. Mind how the breeze outside bassoons and sussurates this cozy house. It swoons like a tuning fork whose tines twist in wind, or a wand whose douse divines love instead of water, divines love instead of future, divines nothing in these signs. Thank you for listening. <laughs>